No problem. Okay. Uh, right. Well, I'm uh, Justin Solomon, and I feel uh, ridiculously silly speaking after a person that's simulating the entire ocean, uh, telling you about our work, which is like deforming cute teddy bears. Uh, but the reality is that there are a lot of interesting numerical problems in, in the computer graphics domain as well. And really, my job here is to convince all of you that there's many interesting problems to solve in this space, and we need all of your help. Uh, so in case I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, I thought I'd give a quick kind of introduction to where we're from and then uh, tell you a bit about some of the research that I thought might be interesting to this crowd. Uh, so I run a group here at MIT that works on problems in the applied geometry space. Um, I think we've developed a reputation for being extremely broad and hard to pin down. We've worked on problems all the way from high dimensional geometry machine learning to some of the things that you'll see here, which are lifted from the sort of computer graphics simulation kind of low dimensional uh, space. So our group has some students that are like working on texturing and things. We've worked on political redistricting and, and more recently on like optimal transport and high dimensional probability. Uh, we also work quite a bit on uh, topology and singularities. And of course, the real application there is in making really interesting pie crusts. And so every Thanksgiving, our students compete to make the most interesting singular point at the, the center of a pie. Um, but in any event, uh, sadly, since I only have 30 minutes to share some of our research today, I thought I'd, I'd uh, tell you a little bit about just one uh, thread in our research that I don't typically get to share, especially in CSAIL, because usually our audience is just companies that want to learn about big data. So instead, I'm going to kind of do something completely different from that uh, and tell you about some problems that we've tackled in the computer graphics domain. So actually, before I came to MIT, and actually before I started graduate school, I used to work at Pixar, the animation studio. And actually, I would argue that a lot of the state of the art and numerical analysis happens in that context, because these are the folks that are simulating all kinds of weird materials and extremely dynamic different physical effects and they needed to be stable enough not just for a physicist to make use of but also like an artist who could care less about you know the the details of whatever partial differential equation you're trying to solve so today, I thought I'd tell you about two pieces of research we have, specifically in the space of optimization. So here, our task is that we're trying to optimize some functional that inputs a shape and outputs a number. So there are a lot of different tasks that fall into this category. For example, maybe I have a T pose of some character, and now I move a few of his joints, and I want to find the kind of most reasonable deformation of that shape that contorts and, and deforms to you know, the artist's input. Or in particular today, we're going to focus on a problem that we care quite a bit about in computer graphics domain, which is turning these 3D cows into the appropriate like low deformation carpet. And in particular, uh, we call this problem parametrization. And the idea here is that I take a 3D surface, I take a pair of scissors to it, so I cut along the surface until it has a disk topology, and then I want to map it into the plane, so that's like this uh, rug that you see in the middle here. And my goal is to optimize distortion of the surface when I do that. And unfortunately, thanks to geometry and topology, I have no choice but to bend and stretch the surface quite a bit when I put it into the plane. And so there's this trade-off, right? I'm trying to uh, essentially push these things into the plane without making cuts that are too long, without taking any one of the triangles on the surface and stretching them out too much. And if any two triangles say, share the same part of the plane, the entire parameterization is useless. Because the reason that we, we use these things is that we want to put some interesting texture like fur or spots on our cow we store it in like a jpeg photograph like the middle and then we map it uh, forward onto the geometry using this this object and so this is an extremely large-scale optimization problem. It's backed by theory of partial differential equation and all kinds of kind of nasty stuff sitting behind the scenes. And it's one that people in computer graphics strive to solve in tiny fractions of a second so that an artist that's interacting with this tool has no idea that there's this large-scale numerical solver that's happening behind the scenes. So today, specifically, I'll tell you about two pieces of research that I thought kind of fit the theme of this conference a little bit. Of course, I should be very clear to note here that you know my job is just to promote. Really, all the interesting stuff is happening thanks to my students uh, and postdocs. And in particular, these are papers that are really due to our, our postdoc, Oded Stein, and my student, Yu. Um, I should note, I think I saw you in the back of the room. Um, I don't know where it went. Uh, but in any event, you is actually on the job market right now, and if you want a fantastic numerical analyst, partial differential equation solver with machine learning background, might I suggest reaching out to him? He's a, been a, a pleasure to work with. So hopefully I won't bring shame to his research in the coming, you know, however many minutes. 
Okay, so again, our goal here is we're inputting some kind of object and we're essentially deforming it into some other pose, like the 3D surface deformed into the plane. And now we need to take this sort of high level task and translate it into something mathematical. And typically when we do that, what we end up with is a formulation that looks something like this. So here, you can think of phi as a mapping that takes points on the 3D object and outputs points on the plane. Then we're gonna focus on just that parameterization problem. And essentially, what we can say is that there's some energy functional which inputs a particular map phi and then outputs a measurement, like does this phi distort my surface a lot or is it pretty good? And so mathematically, if we wanna measure such a thing, we'll take a look at the Jacobian of phi, like the derivative of this map, right? And if that derivative is close to a rotation matrix, then essentially the surface is just moving rigidly into the plane. And as it deviates from a rotation, the surface is stretching out more and more. And this is going to hint at the structure that we're going to make use of later in this talk because essentially this is starting to sound an awful lot like a matrix factorization, right? Like the SVD of a matrix kind of separates out this rotational piece from stretch, which is going to be handy. Okay, so, um, but unfortunately for us, this is integrated over a whole 3D surface or summed over a bunch of triangles, and this is our optimization uh, objective function. This, is, this kind of thing appears everywhere. It appears in differential geometry and variational calculus and now also in like, computer graphics. <laughs> Okay, so now we can take our problem and translate it into something slightly more concrete here. So our space of variables is gonna be one position per vertex of a triangulation of our surface. Right, so we take our cow, we cover our cow in little tiny triangles that describe the surface. And now every one of those vertices gets mapped into the plane, creating this big vector of all the unknowns in our problem. Right, so as I move around vertices, that's changing around entries in this vector. And we can think of our objective uh, function as a sum over every single triangle of some functional, which is measuring how much the triangle stretches. And there's many functionals out there. Uh, the most simple ones might try to measure like how much do the edge lengths change from the input 3D stuff. Or if you're in physics or in material science, you might know that there are these things called constitutive models, which are all about how different materials sort of measure energy in response to different impulse. And it turns out many of those basically translate directly to objective functions in this space. So, great, I've written my problem as an optimization problem, why is this so hard? Well, unfortunately for us, the typical functionals here are rarely convex in nature. In fact, they're sort of very understandably convex because you, you know, you're resisting stretching and you're resisting compression. Um, there are many, many constraints in this problem because we want our entire map to be orientation preserving, to not occupy the same part of the plane. And so we have this extremely large scale problem with tons and tons of constraints. And these are the kinds of headaches that you see in this domain. So here I've borrowed a figure. This is admittedly an early paper in this particular space, but I think it's like a fantastic example of how frustrating it is to work on this domain. So on the left-hand side, I've shown you an input 3D surface. This is we took a space-filling curve and wrapped it around a cylinder, very typical test case. This is actually easy to parametrize. Like this is a rectangular shape just curled around a cylinder. So parametrizing it is just undoing the cylinder, right? But the software doesn't know that. And so the initial guess that it does, uh, we'll see why later in this talk, is mass it to a circle. This turns out to be the one domain that we can do with guarantees. And you can see the distortion is rather large, stretching this, this like little contorted surface uh, into a giant circle. And now you basically do gloria, glorified gradient descent on that objective function I mentioned before to slowly go from a circle all the way to the final confirmation. And you'll see, I know because I've built a career on watching paint dry and, and like waiting for these things to converge, the, that two different frustrating things happen. First of all, it takes 2.3 hours to, to reach this, this final thing. And you can sit and watch, it's like weirdly entertaining and kind of relaxing to watch the vertices move into place. But then it gets so close to the final solution and it gets stuck. And the reason here is that, again, if any two triangles occupy the same piece of the plane, their parameterization is no good. We have this constraint. So when we do a local search, it almost closes up. The surface runs into itself and it says, great, I'm at a local optimum and I'm, I'm, I'm done. Right? And so we waited 2.3 hours and sadly we didn't get the, the result that we wanted. So uh, this is a problem that I care about and studied for years. It's like a very nice, concrete, very self-contained kind of optimization thing to study. So it's very attractive to useless mathematicians like me. Um, but beyond that, I was thinking about the themes of this conference here. And of course, they've got this, this little tagline, right, that a computational trick can also be a theoretical trick. And I was thinking that actually a lot of our research in this space really can kind of fall into uh, this theme here. In particular, 
We can understand this problem from many different languages, from large-scale optimization to differential equations and differential geometry. And there's been this nice feedback of insight to both sides. The people that are working on this problem computationally have noticed really cool structure that helps the theoreticians that are studying this problem and vice versa. Um, and so I'll give you a bit of a clue into some of the th ways that we've thought about this problem and how they bring a little bit of insight into the structure. Um, and if you like this kind of stuff, please let me know. I, like, I'll grab coffee with you and, and talk your ear off. So in particular, our trick is going to be to do some clever changes of variables and reformulation to this kind of problem to kind of reveal that maybe some of the sub-problems and structures inside of this thing are not as complicated as they might appear from the outside. Right, that like that like frustrating test case where our space filling curve kind of got stuck and then couldn't parameterize itself is maybe because we wrote the problem down that like optimizing these x variables here is not so good, but that other choices of how we might express this thing can make a lot of structure kind of appear, both first of all in making faster algorithms and second of all showing that there's actually a lot of really beautiful things that happen when you study these kind of elasticity problems. So now we're going to put up a little bit of math, and then I'm going to go back to showing you cool 3D stuff. <laughs> so in particular, I'm going to show you these two different research papers that we've, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, one from Oded and one from you, that sort of take this problem and then decompose it in two different ways and lead to two totally different algorithms, both of which are pretty close to state of the art in this space. This is one of these frustrating areas where like, if you wait two months, state of the art changes. OK, so uh, the first one is as follows. And so essentially, we're going to make a kind of an observation, which when you say it out loud sounds totally obvious, but actually, if you look at the algorithms, is, is not really reflected in any clever way. So in general, when we think about these different functionals, f, remember the role of this functional f is to take the derivative of my map and tell me how much it's stretching from like a rotation matrix, right? Because like a rotation of a 3D surface doesn't deform it at all, but as I start to stretch it out, like I'm squashing this into the plane, now that's, that's where I have uh, different costs involved. So in particular, when I take the Jacobian of my map, that's uh, the GX in the term here, essentially these functionals input a three by three matrix and they output how close that matrix is to a rotation. Right? Because again, rotation is the gold standard here. And now there are many functionals that could do that. I mean, we could all cook up different ones in this room, you know, like different L1, L2 norms, or maybe something more complicated, like you, like some physical energies respond to stress in different ways in different regimes. You could imagine kind of adapting any of those here. And that's fine. They all translate to different Fs. But there's one really simple property of physics that doesn't get leveraged in this notation, which is if I take my surface, I rotate it, and then I stretch it, it's the same amount of energy, right? Like, the, 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 there's nothing interesting that happens when I rotate stuff. On the other hand, if I write my problem like this, if I rotate this uh, cow carpet thing, I get a completely different vector x on the right-hand side, right? So that structure is not, not captured in the, in the way we've written this down. So in this original paper here, what we did is actually quite simple. We take the Jacobian of this, this map into the plane, so again, that three by three matrix, and we apply a very classical object to it, namely the polar decomposition. You can get this from, from, the, uh, from the SVD, which shows if you take any matrix, we can write it as the product of two things, a unitary matrix and a positive semi-definite one. So a positive semi-definite matrix clearly is not a rotation, at least not an interesting one. Um, and then this unitary object is sort of the rotational piece of, of our gradient. And what you can argue is that basically any reasonable choice of f here should only depend on p, right? Because if I rotate that cow rug, my energy really shouldn't change. So there's actually some really nice hidden structure in this parameterization problem, which is if I take it and I introduce these external variables u and p in addition to my x, if I freeze all the u's, I freeze all the little rotational pieces of my problem, then the remaining part of my problem is actually convex. So there's actually some tiny amount of convex structure hiding in this extremely non-convex elastic optimization problem. And this gave us this little clue as to how we might optimize this thing very quickly, namely to kind of alternate, right? You, you solve this convex problem, which is not just the coordinates, but also part of the deformation, like the amount each triangle is stretching, and then you kind of update the rotations and you continue. I'm going to defer to the research paper to give you all the details of this technique, but essentially the algorithm from an intuitive perspective is nothing more than that. We kind of cycle through all the different variables one at a time and optimize, and you can show that really the only piece of this entire thing that isn't convex is as simple as computing a, an SVD, one per, per triangle, which is something we can do quite fast. 
And so at the end of the day, you get an uh, efficient algorithm for solving this. And in fact, this nice hidden convex structure allows us to prove a convergence result for this algorithm that otherwise would be quite difficult to do. Um, typically, these sort of very non-convex style problems that you borrow from physics, it's very hard to say whether gradient descent even reaches a local optimum. Um, but in this particular case, we can show that this, this very careful choice of algorithms and parameters really does have to converge. Um, in case uh, that was too many equations for you, the good news is that indeed it does work as advertised. So this is a very typical illustration of what these algorithms look like. You put a checkerboard on the plane and you map it onto the surface using the thing you computed. And if it's a good map, the checkers should all kind of be the same shape. Right? And you can see indeed that when we optimize, like on the blue side, uh, you, you do pretty well. Not perfectly. It turns out geometry gets in the way of doing a perfect job here, but, but reasonably well. And in fact, um, if you talk about computational tricks inspiring theoretical tricks, it turns out that our, our postdoc Odud kind of noticed like, gosh, my computations <laughs> when I work out this algorithm are really annoying. And in particular, this little convex piece, you can work out a closed form formula, but it's somehow very ugly with the typical choices of objective functions people use in this domain. And then he made an additional observation is just, if I use this other thing, which also measures how well a matrix conforms to being close to a rotation, this algorithm ends up looking really, really elegant. And essentially, if you kind of reverse engineer the hack that he made to make his parameterization algorithm faster, what you end up with is a really interesting constitutive model for physics that somehow still has some really nice uh, 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 symmetry properties to it, that like compression and stretching are somehow related to one another, which inspired a lot of research in our, our group, not just in algorithms, but actually in constitutive models and physical modeling uh, for these kinds of deformation problems. So this is a really interesting kind of forward and backward feedback that happens in this domain. As usual, I'm talking too much, but in the next couple minutes, I'll tell you a tiny bit about this brilliant insight that you had about this problem, why you being uh, my student, um, which is a completely different way to tackle essentially the same task, but in this case, um, and, and you really do get an extremely efficient algorithm on like ridiculously hard test cases, um, but making use of a very different structure that's also hiding in the geometry here. So even if you don't understand any of the math that I show you, the really exciting thing, practically speaking, is that you can solve these ridiculously challenging tasks like by objectively mapping this entire statue, so she's cut at the bottom of the, the pedestal here, uh, into the letter G, because why not, where no uh, triangle, uh, no two triangles occupy the same piece of the plane. So this is an injective mapping. I think this is a hard task for even humans to do. Like I could give you, you know, a bunch of rubber bands and, and, and pins and you'd struggle with this one. Um, and moreover, uh, user implementation does this in three seconds, <laughs> um, which is I think like about a thousand orders of magnitude better than, than most of the alternatives here. Yeah, we get lucky. <laughs> this injective constraint is really hard to satisfy. So here's uh, going to be the, the, the sort of theoretical trick, is we're going to return to a classical idea, and we're going to essentially reshape it in a way that we can leverage to optimize these complicated objective functions. So remember I showed you that figure where they mapped the space filling curve onto a circle. And the reason is that they were leveraging a theoretical result from the 1960s. This is by uh, Tut is the name. So it's called Tut's Embedding Theorem, which says if you have a triangulated surface and you map it into the plane in a harmonic fashion, meaning that every vertex is a weighted average of its neighbors with positive weights, and the boundary goes to a circle or more generically to a convex shape, then you can show that that mapping specifically, like this guy uh, here on the bottom left, is going to be injective, meaning that no two triangles occupy the same piece of the plane. Unfortunately for us, even though the Tut embedding theorem is extremely convenient as sort of an initial guess for like line search style algorithms, um, it fails in a lot of the cases we care about. So remember that like the letter G that we're squashing that statue into is extremely non-convex, so this theorem doesn't apply. Uh, and in fact, here's an illustration of what it looks like. So here U has mapped uh, something into a plus sign, and if you apply the same formula in Tut theorem, you kind of get this webbing that comes out of the outside of the plus sign, which is where triangles have flipped over. So, so sadly for us, this theorem does not extend to the cases that we care about, um, because we don't want to map all of our surfaces onto to circles. Okay. So what are the pluses and minuses of Tut's theorem? Well, to my knowledge, Tut's theorem is the one theorem out there that gives us a guarantee of, of injectivity using basically a linear system of equation, which is fantastic. The only problem is it's extremely rigid. You need a convex boundary, and you need all of your weights to be positive. But your observation, which is absolutely right, is that the Tut mapping that you get as you deform the 3D surface actually changes. So for example, here we have a bunch of cacti that are deforming in different ways. <laughs> 
And in each one of these cacti, these weights W in this Tut theorem formula change, right? Because vertices get closer or farther to each other on the 3D domain. And so here's what happens. The Tut theorem works for essentially any choices of these positive W. So there's actually an entire space of injective mappings that you can work in. So this is hint number one, but it doesn't get rid of that convex boundary issue. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. So this is giving us a clue. We can kind of optimize in the space of injective maps by instead of optimizing the space of Ws and then differentiating through this tut parametrization process. That's going to be the sneaky trick. And now, how do we parametrize the space of Ws? Well, unfortunately for me, I'm a little low on time, so I think we'll elide some of the details. The basic trick here is that we're going to work with two different notions of geometry. Typically, when we work with triangulated surfaces, our, our geometry is staring us in the face. Like, we have a bunch of coordinate positions in 3D, and it makes perfect sense to compute distances as, like, the difference of the sum of the squares and so on. But somehow, deforming a cactus by moving all of the vertices around turns out to be overkill. Um, that actually what we can do is stick a two by two tensor on every single one of these triangles and kind of simulate stretching the surface locally by just changing the way that we compute dot products. So we don't actually have to deform the surface. We can model that deformation by instead changing how we measure distances along the surface. If you're familiar with Riemannian geometry, this is some kind of discrete version of the same story. So here's going to be the trick. We're going to put a Riemannian metric on our surface. And now we're going to optimize in the space of Riemannian metrics looking at the harmonic mapping that results and find the one that minimizes some other notion of distortion, which if you think about it, is optimizing in the space of injective maps thanks to Tut's theorem. So like, we're leveraging that nice structure, but we still have a search space. And here's the kind of cool thing that happens. So let me let's first translate this into mathematics, and then we're going to give you a theorem which is totally magical, <laughs> which actually helps us with that last little bit, which are these non-convex boundaries. Right? That's what we haven't addressed yet. So here's how we do it. Here's a bunch of equations, but let me, let me break it down for you. So here we've got three variables. U and V are just the mapping into the plane. So X is the position on the surface, and U, V is the, like, the cow rug. And now we're going to add an additional variable, A, which is this two by two matrix. So this is what's measuring stretch and compression. Okay. So our first two constraints here are just this Tut theorem thing. It says that U and V map harmonically into the plane. This is Laplace's equation, if you're familiar from undergrad PDE class. And um, essentially, but notice now that it's actually nonlinear in the sense that A is a variable. We, we have uh, two different variables that are interacting, the mapping itself, but also kind of the way that we measure the distortion of the map, which is A. Right? So as we change A around, this harmonic map changes as well. We need to pin our vertices on the boundary, just like we had before. This is Tut's theorem, exactly, hasn't changed. And now you made this brilliant observation, which is super cool, <laughs> which is essentially borrowed from some literature in differential geometry, which says that if your mapping satisfies two boundary conditions, both Dirichlet conditions and Neumann conditions, then it actually happens to be injective even if your boundary isn't convex. Now, your like, undergrad PDE brain should be like, setting off alarms. Like, you don't get two boundary conditions when you solve Poisson equation. You only get to pin the boundary. The reason that you're allowed to do that is that you have this additional variable A, so there's more wiggle room to work with. So you, so you sort of get to change the way that you measure your Neumann condition by modifying this matrix A until you get this sort of compatibility between both Dirichlet and Neumann. And then there's some theorem out there that guarantees that the resulting map that you get, even though you only check stuff on the boundary, is actually injective everywhere. So, sadly for me, in the space of five minutes, I don't get to give you the, you know, the full details of, of, of this theory. Um, a lot of this is, is sort of borrowed from classical results, but then you actually also proved a discrete version as well that involves just mapping triangles into the plane and shows that there's some analog there. But regardless, this suggests a really nice optimization technique, where essentially what we're going to do is we're going to optimize for that matrix A. For each A, U and V are computed using a linear system of equations, so you can kind of eliminate it. And we're just going to look for the A that leads to the boundary conditions that we want. And this is a nonlinear problem, but it's one that we can solve very quickly using just basically gradient descent. And it turns out to converge uh, quite quickly as long as you kind of work in the right Sobolev space and do all the tricks that we know and love in this, this area of, of PDE. 
So the end result here is an ex like really impressively fast algorithm for parametrizing. So we ran it on this huge data set of 3D models gathered from the wild. These include these totally giant slivery surfaces with like one tiny puncture that you're mapping onto a circle. This is a stress test. It's not something practical that you would do in computer graphics. Uh, and what we found is that this thing converges several orders of magnitude faster than the previous work, and uh, to my knowledge, is the only one that's accompanied with, with some nice theoretical guarantees. Um, uh, yeah, two maths, fantastic. This uh, work is sort of a part of a lot of other research our group has done in this sort of space of optimizing for metrics. This turns out to be a really powerful high-level idea kind of borrowed from optimal control, right? That you can change the parameters of your differential equation and that you get to borrow the nice guarantees of your PDE formulation and kind of change the input to it rather than working with the output uh, directly. In any event, since we're low on time, maybe I'll just give you a quick uh, kind of summary here. The basic point is that this mapping problem, rather than just working with the variables that are staring you in the face, if you rephrase them in terms of the right alternative variables, whether that's the metric matrix or this sort of deformation tensor, gives a lot of insight into the problem, and that's actually fed back into the theory of this, this, this uh, domain. So for example, in the first one, we now have some new interesting constitutive models to work with in physics that seem to work quite well uh, numerically. And in the second problem, we're able to kind of go back and learn some things about these control problems for injective mapping. More broadly, of course, to this audience, I want to share, like, I think it's very easy, especially if you're a mathematician, perhaps, to uh, ignore our domain because we have such pretty pictures. But the reality is that what's going behind uh, all of these crazy computer graphics systems are really interesting and non-trivial, non-linear mathematical problems, and we need your help. So if anybody wants, you know, has any area of expertise in anything related to Julia or, or really any, almost any of Alan's work, my bet is we could find an interesting kind of hammer for that, that nail or nail for that hammer or what have you, and it would be so much fun to learn more. So with that, thank you so much for your time. Happy birthday to Alan, and it's really a pleasure to speak with you all today. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if you have the, somehow the, the surface mapped into 2D, and I guess the 3D geometry, otherwise you just... Well, you could come up with a trivial problem to invert that, which is the letter G itself is a perfectly valid input. Um, <laughs> so the answer is yes. Um, but, but maybe I'll suggest a slightly uh, harder problem, which is um, oftentimes if you have the letter G and a Riemannian metric from, from the original surface, so like you have the triangulation of your domain and the intrinsic geometry of your surface, like how to measure distance, can you realize it? This is a very fam famous problem in classical geometry. Um, the short answer is like, not all second fundamental form tensors have a 3D surface attached to them, um, but uh, sometimes you can, and it is an extremely nonlinear system of PDE to do so. Um, these are the gauss kodatsi equations, but people in physics care about this. For example, for like simulating certain materials with two layers that buckle into a shape, maybe what you want to do is like somehow optimize the metric of the flattened thing so that it buckles into the right geometry. There's some really cool stuff. I can't claim that we work on it here, but they're fantastic problems to think about. Ah, oh, there's one in the back here. Or, oh. are, are there more general sets of boundary conditions that you can look for kind of convergence between the two different solutions? Uh, can, so are there different boundary conditions? Like there are slight boundary conditions and, and so forth. You were, you had, you were mentioning those sets of boundary conditions are getting... Uh, oh, I see. Are there different sets of boundary it's a good question. So, so in this paper from you, the basic problem he's considering is Dirichlet. Like you map into the letter G, so the boundary is constrained. Um, even in that case, there are a lot of different rephrasing of that problem. Like you can start with Dirichlet and work to Neumann or the other way around. Um, more generically, there are versions of this problem with a free boundary where you say, I have a 3D service, I want to put it in the plane, I don't care where the boundary is, I just want it to be bijective. Um, the, this is a somewhat harder problem in this space for kind of tricky technical reasons, um, but it's definitely the next thing to tackle. <laughs> um, so, so stay tuned. <laughs>